My dearly beloved in Christ, today's gospel tells the story of our Lord when he was entering the holy city at the time of his passion, the beginning of Holy Week, on Palm Sunday, he stopped when he came in view of the holy city and he says he wept over it. He wept over the city. So th this shows us the love that our Lord had for the city of Jerusalem, where the temple in honor of his father was. Our Lord must have thought back and reflected on, for example, when he was 40 days old, how he was first presented to his heavenly father in the temple. When he was 12, he went up with his parents to Jerusalem and remained behind, they not knowing where he was. And all of those other times when he entered the temple, when he taught the people the miracles he worked there. So he loved the city and he wept over it for two reasons primarily. One, because he knew it would be destroyed, but even more so because he knew that they were in the process of rejecting him. Despite the hosannas and the welcome on Palm Sunday, it was the same inhabitants that cried out five days later, crucify him, his blood be upon us and upon our children. We have no king but Caesar, away with him, crucify him. And so he wept for those people because of the judgment they were calling down upon themselves. And he predicted, he prophesied that the days would come when their enemies would lay siege to the city and would destroy it. As our Lord said, would, they will beat thee flat to the ground and not leave one stone upon another. Now we know the history of what happened about 40 years later under a Roman army because of the writings of a Jew named Josephus, or as some pronounce him, Josephus. And he was uh, a descendant of uh, the priestly caste. His father was a priest of the Jewish religion. And he lived in Galilee, the northern part of the Holy Land. And he was given charge of a company of soldiers when the Romans came to conquer the Holy Land. Now, of course, the Holy Land, Palestine at that time, was part of the Roman Empire. But the Jewish people chafed under the dominion of Rome. They did not like to pay taxes. They did not like the fact that they were not masters of their own destiny as they had been down through the centuries. And so there were, from time to time, these revolts, refusing to pay taxes, revolting against the Roman government. And finally, you might say that the government in Rome had had enough. And an army was sent under the general Vespasian in the year 67 AD. So Vespasian came and began in the north, in Galilee, and conquered one town after another that resisted. And in one of those towns was this man, Josephus, with his soldiers. And he ended up being captured and predicted that Vespasian, the general, would soon become the emperor of Rome. Well, this army was scheduled to go down to Jerusalem to conquer it, the capital. But there was turmoil in Rome. The emperor had died and Vespasian was called back to Rome and he was made the emperor. And as a result, he trusted Josephus and made him his servant. And he became like a translator and traveled with the Roman army. Well, then a couple years later, Vespasian sent his son Titus to finish the conquest. And Titus went down with the army to Jerusalem. Now, as, as the Romans were heading south towards Jerusalem, all the people around fled from them and they went to Jerusalem. So it was like a divinely ordained punishment for the people because Jerusalem was just thronged with all these people who fled and were inside the city. And when the Romans came, they decided to play the waiting game. They put a rampart all the way around the city. They surrounded the city 
laying siege to it so that the people could not enter or leave the city. And the idea here was to starve them gradually. And that's exactly what happened. And finally, the Roman army broke through the wall and conquered the very last bits of resistance. But the suffering of the Jewish people inside the city during this siege was incredible. And we know about it from, again, the writings of Josephus. He wrote two works primarily. One was called the, the War of the Jewish People, and the other one was something like the Jewish Antiquities, I believe. So there's a lot of historical fact that we learn from his writings. Very interesting writings. And it's interesting that the Christian community that was living in Jerusalem were inspired, their bishop, who at the time was named St. Simeon, was inspired by God to have the Christians leave the city. And they fled before the Roman army came. So they were spared. And that is what our Lord meant in those different prophecies in Scripture. To not go down to take your coat. If you're on the, on the roof of the house, don't even go down to take, flee. They would have, they had to flee immediately. And so they were rescued. But as I said, the Jewish people inside the city were uh, enduring tremendous hunger. And, and finally, again, the Roman army came. And there was even factions in the city fighting amongst themselves. And so you could see divine vengeance. One of the interesting facts that Josephus relates is that the Roman soldiers had been told to whatever they do, spare the temple. Don't damage the temple. The temple was a magnificent building. It was a wonder of the world. And so they were told to spare this beautiful temple. Well, the defenders of the city, the, the Jewish soldiers, made a last stand in the temple. That's where they fled as the Romans were coming into the city and taking it section by section. So they fled to the temple, and that's where the final pitched battle took place. The last defenders... And one of the soldiers or defenders in this battle tipped over a, a lamp and the lamp lit on fire one of the curtains in the temple. And in a short time, the entire temple went up in smoke, up in flames. And the fire was so hot that it melted the gold in the temple. And there was a tremendous amount of gold in the temple. So it became molten and ran down between the rocks in the temple. And so after it cooled, the soldiers wanted to take the gold. And they tore, they literally tore apart one stone from the next to take the gold out that was between the stones. So our Lord's prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. But it's really a, a fascinating and at the same time tragic story to read in the writings of Josephus but our Lord predicted it and he loved the city and he loved the people so he wept over it because he knew that God's just chastisement would come even though it was about 40 years later in the year 70 when Titus and his army finally conquered the city of Jerusalem. This should remind us that Almighty God works slowly, sometimes it seems. Sometimes we, we say to ourselves, well, why does God allow the evils that are in the world? Why does he not punish the wicked? Well, the time will come. We do not understand God's timetable, but the time will come. And those who blaspheme God, who live evil lives, they will render an account for that. Every single sin must be atoned for. Our Lord even said, we shall have to render an account for every idle word. But just because God's vengeance does not strike at once does not mean that it will not come sooner or later. And in this regard, sometimes we can be tempted to become very depressed, very discouraged about the seeming triumph of evil. And again, in, in God's plan, there's a reason for everything. 
And there's a reason why he gives the devil his hour. Do you remember the words of our Lord when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas and the band of soldiers that came with him? He said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So God gives the devil his temporary triumphs. But it should not cause us to become depressed or to doubt that God will ultimately triumph. And for reasons unknown to us, he permits the devil to has, have these temporary triumphs. But sooner or later, he will punish evil and good will triumph in the end. So there are a number of lessons that we can learn from this gospel, but let us especially remember the importance of living according to God's holy will every day. Now, in the epistle, St. Paul concludes today's epistle with those famous words we've heard before often, God will not tempt you, or no, I'm sorry, God will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation will also give you a way out that you may bear it. That is this translation. There are other translations, but the gist of that is God will give you the grace to overcome temptation. God will never tempt someone beyond what he is able to conquer with God's help. We can never say, I can't conquer this sin. The temptation is too great. It's not possible. We can never say that. That would be to doubt or deny even God's love, his providence, and the power of his grace. Now, it may be that we are being tempted very strongly and of ourselves we cannot overcome it. But we can pray. And with that prayer, God will help us. He will give us the help to conquer that temptation. Now, Saint Philomena is a wonderful saint for several reasons and a very powerful saint. Her relics, her tomb, remained unknown in the catacombs in Rome for several not several, for about 15 centuries. She was martyred in the early 300s under Diocletian, and archaeologists or uh, those that were examining the catacombs did not uncover her tomb until I think the year 1802. And then her relics were taken to a small town close to Naples, called Mugnano, and immediately there began to be incredible miracles, the most famous regarding a devout Catholic woman from France who was literally at the point of death. And she did so much good for the church and for souls, founding the propagation of the faith and the Society of the Holy Childhood, the Living Rosary. And in fact, when she heard about St. Philomena and had this great desire to go there and visit her shrine in Mugnano, Italy. She passed through Rome and she stopped to see the Pope, Gregory XVI. And he said to the Cardinals, we will, we will never see her again in this life. She certainly will die on this journey. And what was his surprise when she came back a couple months later or so, completely cured after visiting the shrine? But there were numerous, so many miracles granted at the shrine of St. Philomena that the Pope called her the Wonder Worker. St. Philomena, the Wonder Worker. So I encourage you to learn about her and to honor her and to invoke her, to pray to St. Philomena. It seems that God preserved her for our times since she was undiscovered until the 1800s. But also it seems that God is now wishing to make up to her for the honor that she did not receive for all these centuries because she was unknown and undiscovered. But she is an example of conquering temptation. She is a virgin and a martyr. And she is pictured with the palm of martyrdom and the anchor because they tried, and sometimes with arrows, they, she was sentenced to be pierced with arrows and then she miraculously recovered. They tried it again and the arrows turned around in midair and came back and struck the archers. They tried to drown her in the Tiber River and then found her on the 
after tying an anchor, tying her to an anchor and throwing her in the water, found her then safe on the shore, and she was finally beheaded. So she must be very dear to Jesus and Mary because of her love of God, her perseverance, her willingness to die, and her love of virginity, a virgin martyr. So let us invoke her and ask her help to help us, like her, conquer temptation, which we always can do with God's help. Our Lord says to us, as he said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.